Hello, everyone. Uh, I, Sayyid Alha Tirmizi, on behalf of Swiss Energy Alliance and Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, the University of Texas at Austin, USA, welcome you all to the second of the three Facebook Live events as part of the International Switch Energy Case Competition. So today, PGE has assembled a panel of energy professionals to discuss sustainability in the oil and gas sector. PGE is the supporter of the International Switch Energy Case Competition. It holds number one graduate and number two undergraduate ranking for the petroleum engineering program according to the US News and World Report. So energy poverty is a grand challenge for the society. The oil and gas sector has excelled at providing energy that is reliable, affordable, and abundant. Recent efforts have focused on sustainability in the oil and gas industry in light of the growing concerns over the impact of climate change. So today's panel will cover topics of current interest and look towards the future. So after the panelist presentations, they will answer questions that have been submitted to the Google Forms that was linked in the email yesterday. So feel free to submit the additional questions to the Google Form during the presentation. Now, I would like to introduce to you all to Dr. John Olson. Dr. Olson is the chair of PGE. He has been a member of the University of Texas at Austin Petroleum Engineering faculty for 25 years, which he joined after six years with Mobile Research and Development Corporation. In 2016, he was named as a distinguished member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE, and the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. He has published nearly 100 scholarly papers and has Google Scholar citation of over 7,000. So his research focuses on production optimization and environmental impact issues related to hydraulic fracturing and unconventional oil and gas development. So ladies and gentlemen, Without further ado, I would like to introduce, uh, welcome Dr. John Olson. Thank you very much, Tala, and thank you to the Switch Energy Alliance. The uh, Hildebrand Department at the University of Texas is proud to be sponsoring and hosting this event with you, and we're really excited about this energy poverty case competition. Um, in particular, I want to uh, call out to the students that are watching us today um, that all of us, um, the whole panel and moderators and, and everybody at SWITCH and, and the Hildurand Department are excited to see so many of you interested in energy and how energy impacts our daily lives and um, really is an integral part of our world and a grand challenge for us to manage well. And the, um, the theme of the the theme of the uh, panel today, let me share my screen. The theme of the panel today is sustainability in the oil and gas sector. And as you'll see, oil and gas is dominant, is the dominant energy source for us throughout the world. And we'll talk about some of the issues related to that and hopefully show you some interesting ideas about our way forward in, um, in oil and gas. So let me just um, make an annotation here. The, the, the slides you see here, we have a, a flare in West Texas. Um, so this part of the oil and gas business, we'll talk a little bit about the impact of flaring. This, this picture in the center is, here is an oil field in California, which also is inside of a, a, a California condor refuge. And here we have a, um, uh, concrete gravity platform in Norway being towed out to sea. So you see there's many different ways that the oil and gas business interacts with nature and also interacts with society. And so we hope to touch on some of those issues today. So let me introduce to you then um, my co-moderator for the discussion, Dr. Wen Song. Uh, 
She's an assistant professor in the Hildebrand Department at the University of Texas at Austin. And her research focuses on understanding and leveraging the fundamental micro and nanoscale transport dynamics that dictate subsurface energy and environmental resources. Her key contributions towards addressing the grand challenge of supplying reliable and sustainable energy to society include pioneering the field of real rock microfluidics to enable direct real-time poor scale visualization of transport dynamics in various micro nano fluidic systems and with representative um, characteristics. She obtained her PhD in energy resource economics at Stanford University and also has a minor PhD minor in mechanical engineering. So let me pass the screen, well, I'll keep the screen, but pass the, the microphone on to Wen, and she'll introduce our panel and our first speaker. You're still muted, Wen. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Great. Thanks for the introduction, John. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm uh, Wen Song, and I'm going to be moderating uh, this panel along with John. Um, so I'd like to kick things off by first introducing our panelists uh, in the order that they will speak. So John, can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, so our first panelist um, is, uh, is Shayla Gerardo. So Shayla is a graduate student in my research group here at University of Texas at Austin. Um, she grew up in Angola and she completed her bachelor's in petroleum engineering uh, at the University of Oklahoma. So Shayla's research, uh, you know, coming from my research group, uh, so she uses microfluidic devices to understand and discover fundamental microscale um, fluid rock phenomena that dictate uh, the recovery of energy material resources. And she will kind of set the stage for our discussion uh, during this panel by providing an overview of the current state of energy usage, its our resources um, in the infrastructure, as well as open kind of our discussion on the challenges that are related to sustainability uh, in the oil and gas sector. Um, so our second uh, panelist is Professor Martin Blunt. So Martin is a, a professor at Imperial College London where his research group performs uh, experimental, theoretical, and numerical research into many aspects of flow and transport and pore systems, including pore scale imaging, modeling, and analysis of displacement processes that are you know, important for, for example, oil and gas recovery, as well as CO2 storage, um, as well as large scale simulation using streamlined based methods. So broadly speaking, Martin's group uh, works in the areas of oil and gas recovery, CO2 uh, storage and geological systems, uh, as well as the uh, potential contaminant uh, transport and cleanup of aquifers. Uh, his many accomplishments include serving as uh, editor-in-chief of the journal Transport and Forest Media. Um, he's published over 250 scientific uh, publications and is an elected fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. So Martin will explain to us kind of the idea and importance um, of uh, you know, climate uh, emissions related uh, challenges. So specifically in carbon capture and storage. Um, our third panelist is Professor Steve Bryant. So Steve is uh, the University of Calgary's first Canada Excellence Research Chair and leads the exploration for new and sustainable ways to develop unconventional oil uh, reservoirs by taking advantage of advances in material science. Um, Steve's research includes of course media modeling, uh, developing theory for reactive transport as well as CO2 sequestration. Prior to uh, joining the University of Calgary, uh, Steve was actually a professor here at the Hildenbrandt Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT Austin. Um, his many uh, achievements include over 110 journal publications, 150 conference presentations, and 100, over 190 uh, conference proceedings. So Steve will show us some of, uh, you know, some of the creative ways uh, that we can go about achieving a carbon neutral or even better yet, a carbon negative economy. And he'll explain kind of what that means. 
Um, so, and then lastly, uh, our fourth panelist is Scott Anderson. So Scott is a senior director of energy at the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, sp Scott spent many years in the oil and gas industry prior to joining the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, so for example, he was the former executive vice president and general counsel of the Texas Independent Producers and Royalty Owners Association. Um, he was the longtime secretary of the liaison committee of cooperating oil and gas associations and is currently a member of the committee of visitors uh, for the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. So since 2005, Scott uh, has uh, served as the Environmental Defense Fund's point person on policies related to, uh, to land and water impacts of oil and gas uh, development and to the geological sequestration of carbon dioxide. So Scott focuses on uh, effectively reducing the environmental footprint of oil and gas uh, operations. And here he will discuss uh, some of the regulatory and policy aspects of deploying carbon capture and storage. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, great. So I think let's kick things off uh, with Shayla. So Shayla, do you wanna go ahead? Um, sure, thank you so much. Um, <coughs> Thank you so much, Professor Sun, for the introduction. And thank you uh, to the Department of Hildebrand and Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering for inviting me for this panel. So uh, before we get started into the heart of this panel, I wanted to start by giving a brief overview of the energy consumption across the world and how does that correlate to the standard of living for different countries. So in your graph of the left, you can see that you have energy consumption uh, uh, per capita, and that's correlated with GDP per capita for different countries. So when we look at countries with higher GDP per capita, for instance, the United States, Germany, and Canada, those countries also have some of the highest energy consumptions per individual. But if you see countries with a much smaller GDP per capita, for instance, uh, my home country, Angola, India, Indonesia, people in those countries are also consuming much less energy. But the key point here is that as economies grow for those countries in the lower left corner, what we expect is that the energy consumption for those countries will also be uh, growing. When you look at the graphs at the right, we see that countries such as the United States and Germany have had their energy consumption pretty flat for the past 20 years. But if you compare it to booming economies like India and China, uh, their energy consumption has been increasing quite rapidly for the past 20 years. Now, when we think about where the energy that we consume today and how we power our increasing energy demands, we see that the energy sector has a greater, uh, has a greater uh, impact on how we are powering our energy. And we need to look a little bit from a, uh, historic perspective. So when you look at about 200 years ago, our energy was coming mostly from biomass. So we're looking at biomass as our main energy resource. And around mid to, eight, to late 1800s, we have the onset of the coal and that started taking over our energy sector. And about early 1900s, oil and gas starts gaining some traction and actually start taking a bigger chunk of the energy sector. And at the moment, when we combine the fossil fuels energy sector, that's about 80% of the total energy uh, consumption uh, that we have at the moment. So one of the reasons why we have the switch from wood to coal to oil, we can think about it in terms of energy density. If you think about coal versus wood, you need 50% less material to produce the same amount of energy if you use coal than wood. And similarly, if you think about oil versus coal, you'll need 50% less material if you're using oil instead of coal. A couple of other reasons why oil and gas industry or fossil fuels overall are the dominant uh, energy resource right now are the fact that it's cheap to produce, it's reliable, and it's easy to use and to transport when you compare it to some of the other uh, energy resources that we have at the moment. If we look at how uh, the oil and gas industry compares to um, the other industries within the energy sector. If we go to the next slide, 
um, what we see is that from a regional perspective and from a global perspective, oil and gas takes about between 60 to 90 percent for most regions of the world of the energy consumption is powered by uh, oil and gas. And in terms of coal, it, it's the most significant energy resource that is used in Asia Pacific. But as you add up all of those fossil fuel sectors, we're looking at somewhere between 70% all the way to almost 90% of the total regional energy mix. Now, if we compare that with renewables, they're uh, taking only about 10% or less of the total energy consumption. And while they are increasing their energy um, output over the years, they don't have yet the same extent and they're not powering as much of the energy consumption at the moment for different regions of the world. Now, if we move to the next slide, <laughs> oil and gas is definitely our main and dominant energy resource, but we need to start thinking how we can make it more sustainable. And before we get into that, we need to define what the sustainability means within the oil and gas context. So sustainability has about three categories. We have the environmental impact of the industry. So how can the oil and gas industry have a net neutral or maybe even a positive impact on the environment? We have the social impact. How does the oil and gas industry affect communities and how communities in return affect the oil and gas industry? And from a business perspective, we need to think about can the oil and gas industry continue to innovate uh, such that it remains competitive in the energy market. Out of those three key categories, environmental is definitely the most challenging one for the oil and gas industry and the one that poses several key issues that must be addressed as oil and gas becomes more sustainable. Now, as we break down those key environmental issues, there are a couple of them that really stick out. So we have CO2 emissions, which is the largest group of greenhouse gas emissions at the moment. We have methane emissions that have, even though they're not as highly emitted as CO2 emissions, they have a much greater warming uh, capacity in our atmosphere. We have gas flaring, we have wastewater uh, that needs to be managed and produced. And there are a couple of other issues that directly or indirectly are a result of fossil fuels usage and production. So at this point, we'll be talking a little bit about some of those issues and we'll be, there's gonna be a little more focus on CO2 emissions just because of their greater impact on the environment. So when we think about that impact, um, there are a couple of things that we need to think about. First is the volume of fossil fuel CO2 emissions and how, what are the trends at the moment as we move forward? And second, how does that fit into the big global warming picture? In terms of fossil fuel CO2 emissions, the numbers are quite staggering. So we're looking, for instance, uh, China is producing about 10,000 megatons of CO2 yearly. And that number has also been increasing just because it's a growing economy. We have uh, United States and Europe that have been slightly decreasing, but their numbers in terms of CO2 emissions within the fossil fuels industry are still pretty significant. And when you think about that in terms of global warming, you can see that, for instance, for the United States, the fossil fuels CO2 emissions actually account for 75% of the total greenhouse gas emission forces. And if you think about it, even a much smaller country with a much smaller economy like my country, Angola, where you only have about 30 megatons of CO2 emitted from the fossil fuels industry, that still accounts for uh, about 50%, about half of our greenhouse gas emissions come from fossil fuels. So there's definitely a need for the oil and gas industry to step up and actually start addressing how we can solve the CO2 emissions issue, especially if we are to meet some of the um, climate warming goals or you know climate change uh, goals that we have set, such as becoming a net zero carbon society by 2050. So. I will stop here and let Professor Blunt take over and talk a little more about the solutions for some of those issues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Also, I'd like to give my thanks to the organizers for allowing me to talk. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege.
to be able to give my own thoughts about sustainability in the oil and gas industry. So when we're talking about the oil and gas industry, there's a, an elephant in the room, which is the contribution to CO2 emissions and uh, climate change. So if we think about the UN framework on climate change, this is COP21 with a goal to prevent dangerous climate change by limiting the temperature increase by two degrees with an aspiration of making it one and a half degrees. And as has already been shown, that's simply incompatible with the unabated production and use of fossil fuels at anything like our current level. And you know, many, many people are realizing this. I just give one example here, Naomi Klein, who is better known as a social activist, who four years ago wrote a book, This Changes Everything. This is the big problem to look at. So why is this a problem? This has already been shown before. Here we have date. This is 2020. These are billions of tons of CO2 being emitted into the atmosphere. This big red arrow is my own interpretation. Uh, our current emissions are on an upward trend, COVID notwithstanding. If we're going to prevent dangerous climate change, our CO2 emissions need to drop. They need to drop rapidly. OK, and we can even see that by 2050, we want to have negative emissions. And uh, my colleague Steve Bryant will be addressing that particular issue. So how do we deal with it? You either close the fossil fuel industry or you deal with the CO2 produced. We cannot carry on as we are at present. So what is the scale of the problem? What's shown here is how much CO2 we can emit in total, not per year, in total, to prevent global warming of about two degrees. There is obviously a range of uncertainty here. We're looking at one and a half degrees, so we're definitely going to be on the lower end there. What's shown here in the dark is the oil, gas and coal that we know is there, which we can produce. What's shown in the lighter colours are likely resources. So, you know, if we try hard and explore elsewhere, we may be able to produce more oil and gas. You can see that those numbers don't add up. We can produce a reasonable fraction of the oil and gas that we know that we have, but we really have to limit uh, coal use almost immediately. And you can see that we can't continue to expand unabated production. Now, this is a university or student competition. Um, students are aware of this problem and are campaigning on campuses for a number of things. First is a simple a disengagement, a divestment from university endowments in fossil fuel companies, but also looking at the research and the funding that universities receive from the fossil fuel industry. So here's a Stanford University in the States. Here's a report earlier this year, half of UK universities have committed to divestment. Most recently, this is just last week, Cambridge University is to divest from fossil fuels and also look at research funding. I'm from Imperial College London. Um, and here in the main entrance of Imperial College London is rather implausibly a statue of Queen Victoria. You will notice that it has been decorated. This was the a, a somewhat surreal week, the week uh, before we went into lockdown in March. Um, and uh, it was the, the main entrance was taken over by a climate change protest, essentially a sit-in. And you can see the comments here that come from that protest. So how did Imperial respond? There is a strategy of divestment, but actually divestment not, in fact, from the oil and gas industry, but certainly from coal and tar sand extraction. But what about the oil industry itself? BP is one of a number of major independent oil companies that have made a commitment, just like that graph of where we have to be, to be net zero by 2050. And what that means is you have to somehow offset the CO2 that's emitted, both from oil field operations, but also when the oil and gas are burnt. Okay, you need to offset set those emissions in some way. 
At the moment, most oil companies are actually a little vague on exactly how they're going to achieve net zero. OK, but it's certainly their intention is to be continuing to produce oil and gas. So how can you do it? Well, the way in which you do it is through carbon capture and storage. Here is an illustration of a carbon capture and storage project uh, in the Norwegian North Sea that has been uh, storing a million tons of CO2 each year since 1996. In this particular case, it's natural gas from a gas field contains CO2. The carbon dioxide is separated out and then re-injected into an aquifer. What we would have to do instead is separate out CO2 from the flue gas of a gas powered power station, for instance, or from refinery sites or other parts of heavy industry and put that CO2 underground. So is this some wacky idea that no one's really thought of before? No, it isn't. Virtually every serious assessment of how we're going to prevent dangerous ch climate change has a key role for carbon capture and storage. And the reason is that we have an economy that's utterly dependent on petroleum products. So we can't really move the world away from them. We can have renewables, but renewables are intermittent. So you have to have a huge overcapacity of renewables. What we can do instead is use, for instance, burning gas as a swing producer and for heavy industry, but that CO2 has to be placed underground. So if we look here, we're in 2020, this is different projections under different scenarios of how much CO2 we need to store per year. And look at the numbers, 20, 30 gigatons per year, that almost matches our current total global emissions. It's gonna be significant. We're going to create doing this an industry the size of the oil and gas industry, if not larger. And where are all the skills to doing that? It's in the oil and gas industry. It's involved, instead of taking fluids out of the ground, it involves putting fluids back underground. So here's a sustainable strategy for the oil industry, committing to be net zero by 2050. But here, it isn't net zero by planting some trees and hope they grow or hope they don't burn. Um, but to store a volume of CO2 underground that matches every molecule of CO2 that is produced in oil field operations and when it's burnt. So one molecule of CO2 goes into the atmosphere, one molecule of CO2 at least goes underground. And the oil industry doesn't just have to sit there and hope that it's imposed on them, they've actually got to make this happen. Um, and the idea is to commit to store a percentage of your CO2 that rises to 100% by 2050. I'll end here. This is a documentary presented by David Attenborough on extinction. It's about the impact that human beings have had on the natural world. But there's also a risk of extinction for independent oil companies if they don't address this problem seriously. So in this contest, we're looking at providing energy to energy poor regions of the world, independent oil and gas companies have an enormous role to play there. But if they don't address climate change, their ability, their license to operate in much of the world might go away. And that won't solve climate change because there will be unabated fossil fuel emissions from around the world from companies that aren't acting under the same constraints. So here's really a call to arms. There is a way that the oil and gas industry can still contribute to enormous, unprecedented levels of worldwide prosperity while addressing straightforwardly and seriously the threat of dangerous climate change. Okay, thank you very much. Great, uh, so next we have uh, Professor Steve Bryant. Steve, do you wanna take it away? Steve, you're on mute. 
Okay, thank you. Since um, I'm now controlling John's screen, I can no longer control my screen, I apologize. Um, so Martin has laid out very nicely what the role of carbon management is going to have to be for us to make progress on both the climate change issue and the energy poverty issue. So what I would like to do now, I can now move the mouse, but I can't advance the slides. Maybe John, you could advance the slide. So a key word in all this conversation is going to be and. I'm not gonna suggest doing something instead of something else. We have to apply a lot of different approaches to address the issue. But so, so Shayla and Martin both laid out very nicely the macro uh, issues uh, facing civilization uh, and our economy and the role of fossil fuels. I wanted to return for a moment before I jump in and tell you what the negative emission story is to, to talk about energy poverty for just a moment. You remember Shayla's slide? Remember the, okay, I have to do this like this. Up there in the top right corner, were the high energy consumption per capita countries with the high GDP. So I'm lucky enough to live in one of those countries. It's minus 13 this morning in Calgary. There's 15 centimeters of snow on the ground. My house is warm because of natural gas. And when I made breakfast, I used electricity that was generated with natural gas. And the air quality outside in Calgary is some of the best in the world and inside my house, it was also great. Lucky me, because for some more than 2 billion people on this planet, 2 billion people, right? Uh, you know, getting to be a third of them. When they made breakfast this morning, wherever they were, they set fire to something. It wasn't natural gas, most likely. It was probably wood, might've been coal, might've been dried animal dung. So those of you who are concerned with energy poverty, go look up how many preventable deaths from indoor air pollution are occurring in developing countries. That is entirely preventable, not with medical intervention, but with energy intervention. So natural gas is a great option as those of us uh, living in developed countries know, but as Shayla and Martin also pointed out, you burn natural gas, you produce carbon. Can we square this circle? So one way to address both uh, extending the benefits of fossil fuels in the, in the energy poverty, uh, energy impoverished world, um, while addressing the climate is in addition to the carbon capture that, that uh, uh, Martin mentioned, something called, we'll call it negative emissions. I'll show you why I wanna call it negative emissions in just a moment. So a whole lot of things have changed in the last couple of years. And so you might've missed this one, uh, but if you've been around as long as I and Professor Blunt uh, have been, you will have noticed that, so what you'll see on the x-axis here is 30 years or so uh, recent history. And the discussion there was about avoided emissions. Capture CO2 from fossil fuel fired power plants, for example, and store it. All that period of time, the notion of negative emissions and a negative emission is simply, instead of capturing CO2 from flue gas, you actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Think of it as legacy CO2 that was resulted from burning a long time ago. Negative emissions is where you take it directly from the atmosphere and store it. The reason that's a crazy idea is no engineer would say, well, let's, let's take a, a very dilute 400 parts per million stream and try to capture CO2 when we've got these five, 10% CO2 streams out of flue gases. It was a crazy idea, but it is now the case, given the carbon budget numbers that you just saw, we have to avoid emissions, as Professor Blunt said, and we have to actively pull CO2 out of the atmosphere if we're going to get anywhere close to these net zero emissions. So the other thing that changed dramatically in the last um, couple of years is, and this just floored me, the annual uh, meeting, the big meeting of the Society of Petroleum Engineers was here in Calgary a year ago. Um, and the opening session was about carbon mitigation. That's unprecedented as far as I know at SPE meetings. 
And about that time, and I won't go through all those pictures you see on the right, company after company, as Professor Blunt pointed out with BP, most recent one was ConocoPhillips two days ago, have made net zero commitments. That is an extraordinary thing for the oil and gas industry to do. You would Five years ago, I would have never have predicted that, certainly 10 years and 20 years ago. And part of this is because if you wish to maintain continued investment in these industries, you've got to be addressing the issue. So how can you do it? How do you do negative emissions? So I'm not gonna go into detail in this slide. There are nature-based solutions. Those are sort of the top there on the left, the natural ones. There are technological ones. And I'll talk about that one for a moment. And there's hybrid ones. Um, so the direct air capture with storage is the one we'll talk about today. Uh, this is a thing. So in fact, the company who's now building with Oxy uh, in, in Texas, uh, direct air capture units, carbon engineering uh, started here in Canada, uh, demonstrated the technology, and now they're building it out at scale. Oxy plans to capture a million tons a year from the atmosphere uh, in the Permian Basin. There are other ways to do this. We won't go into them here unless you have questions about it. But a key challenge in all of this, as both Shayla and, and Professor Blunt pointed out, is the scale of the problem. And so anything we do is going to have to be at a very big scale, uh, as Professor Blunt pointed out. That has impacts for nature-based solutions. So we can discuss the trade-offs if you like. But here's what I want to do. I want you to think about combining a negative emissions technology, direct air capture is one we'll talk about here on the, on the left, with things that we already know how to do. So let's talk about conventional energy production. Let's talk about oil and gas. That's today's uh, topic. And so it is entirely possible to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, compress it, inject it into a reservoir, produce oil, produce gas, use them as we are already using them in all the built infrastructure that's out there. But if you cap, if this blue arrow that you're capturing, <laughs> in simple terms, if that arrow is fatter than the arrow that is the result of all the production process, the consumption, the combustion, as long as that blue arrow is bigger than that red arrow, that is a net negative emissions technology. You will have removed CO2 from the atmosphere while still using the oil and gas that you produced, okay? And a key part of this is you could use some of that energy that you produce to actually operate the direct air capture device. This has been one of the key challenges for building out that technology. It requires energy to do it. So the co-location or the combination of a negative emissions technology and a well-established oil or gas production technology has the potential to be um, a net negative uh, process. Why does that matter? As Professor Blunt and, and Shayla both pointed out, the scale is big. If you're not doing gigatons of CO2 a year, it, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. It won't make a difference. This would be scalable. I'll show you a calculation in a moment. Even more importantly, to my mind, for negative emissions technologies, there are not very many options. We do not have time to develop some magic bullets. It's not going to happen. This is something a lot of the infrastructure is already in the ground, existing oil and gas wells. We could do this on a time scale that matters, as I um, mentioned, it's net negative. So let's, let's look at this for the case of oil production. I will just mention you can do this with gas as well. Um, for the sake of time, I won't, I won't talk about it here. I just want to show you a key thing that happens when you do oil production. So um, let me, before we do that, let me just point out oil reservoir. Think uh, Permian Basin, Texas, where this has been happening for more than 40 years. This is well established. Uh, there are a number of companies who do this for a living. They inject CO2, they buy it um, from uh, a pipeline, which is not um, anthropogenic CO2. Um, okay, the slide went away. Did I do that? Maybe you should re Where were we, John? Okay, apologies. So we know how to do the CO2 um, and uh, oil production. And what happens, every oil and gas operator knows, is that you will also produce water as you do this. Okay. And so you got to do something with the, with the water. For this to work, for it to be net negative, you've got water coming to surface. Here I'm just showing you storing it. You could imagine doing productive things with it. I'll leave that as a, as a, as a possibility for you. 
But here's the other key point about scalability. If you were to do this with a million barrels of, uh, produce a million barrels of oil every day, that's 1% of projected world demand. That was world demand before the economic uh, consequences of, of COVID lockdown. If you produce a million barrels a day this way, and you produce and store 5 million barrels of uh, brine per day, you would pull a net 100 million tons of CO2 per year out of the atmosphere. That's material. That's, that's a scale at which you can make a difference. Okay? But a key part here is you've got to move the brine out. You can't do conventional uh, EOR when you re-inject the, the, uh, the CO2. Okay, so here's the point. Here's the vision. We can do decarbonization with a technology that allows us to continue to take advantage of the benefits and a whole lot of built infrastructure um, that are associated with oil and gas. Okay, so if we do this with, with conventional oil and gas productions, what we need to add in and deploy quickly are, this is a, uh, an artist rendition of what a uh, large scale uh, direct air capture installation might look like. But we have markets for this. We don't have to come up with a way to distribute other forms of energy. We have infrastructure. So there's a lot to be said for looking at oil and gas, not just as a way to um, pull people out of economic poverty, but at the same time, help pull the planet um, out of the uh, carbon, <laughs> the very unpleasant carbon future, which awaits us if we don't do things. So just, I'll be happy to discuss this when we get a chance here in a moment uh, in the panel. Thanks very much. Okay, great. So um, thank you to uh, professors Blunt and uh, Bryant for kind of setting the stage for, you know, the really the need uh, to achieve carbon, at least uh, a carbon neutral economy, or, you know, maybe potentially a carbon negative economy. So next, right, so we've kind of seen from the, the um, technical perspectives of why we need this and how we might potentially get there. Um, our next speaker, uh, Scott, will, uh, you know, kind of set the stage for what are the um, policy and regulatory uh, aspects of getting this actually deployed. So Scott, um, do you wanna go ahead? Thank you. Uh, I would like to do four things uh, today. Uh, first, uh, since we're discussing sustainability in the oil and gas sector, I'd like to suggest that sustainability in this, se in this sector be defined uh, as, as being consistent with a concept of sustainable development uh, that, that has been established by the United Nations. Uh, second, uh, I'll name the major environmental impacts of oil and gas. Third, I'll make a few comments on how strict the limits need to be uh, on these impacts. And finally, I'll touch briefly on some of the practical aspects of limiting uh, uh, climate impact uh, from the oil and gas sector. Uh, turning to the first item, defining what we mean by sustainable oil and gas development, I'll acknowledge that not everyone uses the same definition, but my suggestion is to follow a definition uh, that is said to be the most frequently cited uh, definition to date. It was published by the United Nations, as I said. Uh, the UN had recognized in the 1970s and 80s the need for a development concept that would allow reconciling economic development and um, environmental protection. It created a commission uh, called the Brunt, Bruntland Commission uh, to address this. And the commission issued its report, uh, which was called Our Common Future in 1987. The report defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, they emphasize two key concepts. First, the concept of needs, in particular, the essential needs of the world's poor, uh, 
And secondly, the idea of limitations imposed by the state of technology and social organization on the environment's ability to meet both present and future needs. The second thing I wanted to do today is to simply list the major environmental impacts from oil and gas uh, that need to be limited. Uh, there are two categories, climate impacts and other environmental impacts. The notable climate impacts from the production, transportation, and use of oil and gas are CO2 emissions and methane emissions. Other environmental impacts include impacts to land, water, and air quality. Land impacts can be locally significant, including disruption of sensitive wildlife habitat. Water impacts include both uh, use of fresh water and water pollution. Uh, air quality impacts can include health effects on people living near facilities, as well as regional impacts such as haze that degrades visibility. This leads us to the third thing I want to address, which is how strict do limitations on these environmental impacts need to be? How can we decide? I would argue that despite the complexity and uncertainties related, relating to climate, that, that these questions are easier to answer in the climate arena than they are for other environmental impacts. As has been discussed, there is widespread agreement that greenhouse gas emissions from human activities uh, need to be net zero by 2050. As Steve and Martin explained, this doesn't mean that all emissions must stop, but to meet the net zero goal, any remaining emissions from human activity need to be offset by negative emissions removing carbon from the atmosphere rather than just avoiding or reducing emissions. There's not nearly as much agreement though uh, regarding the non-climate environmental impacts, the impacts to land, water, and air quality. How much do these impacts need to be limited in order for oil and gas development to count as sustainable? I don't have a complete answer to that, but I would recommend uh, one principle uh, that you take a look at uh, from, it's a risk management concept known as ALARP, ALARP, which stands for as low as reasonably practicable. For a risk to be as low as reasonably practicable, it must be possible to demonstrate that the cost involved in reducing the risk further would be grossly disproportionate to the benefit gained. The term arose from legislation in the United Kingdom, uh, particularly the UK's Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974. Finally, I'd like to offer what I hope will be uh, two practical resources um, for limiting the risks that oil and gas development poses uh, to climate. Uh, the first one has to do with carbon capture and sequestration. Um, as, as to carbon capture and sequestration, or CCS, uh, please remember that for it to be effective, projects must be done right. And a lot is known about what it takes to do CCS project rights, projects right. Uh, but one report in particular is foundational. And that is a special report on CCS published by the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, in 2005. The report articulated a scientific consensus that CO2 sequestration in sedimentary basins, I, I would ask you to remember, this is only about sedimentary basins, CO2 sequestration in sedimentary basins would be effective if two conditions are satisfied. Uh, first, sites must be properly selected. You can't do CCS just anywhere. And second, even well-selected sites must be properly managed. This means characterizing the geology, uh, doing a risk analysis to identify potential leakage pathways, developing a site-specific monitoring program 
and eventually using monitoring results uh, together with numeric modeling, not just to show that CO2 is not leaking now, but that it will not leak in the future either. So if you wanna learn more about that, the place I would start would be that IPCC special report from 2005. Uh, the, the other uh, greenhouse gas associated uh, with oil and gas development is methane. Uh, met methane uh, causes about 20% of the temperature increase that we are experiencing. And about 60% of the methane in the environment is due to human activity. And about 25% of that 60% uh, is due to the, uh, is from the energy sector, uh, which would include coal as well as, as oil and gas. Um, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. It's more than 20 times as potent over a hundred year period uh, and more than 80 times as potent over a 20 year period. So it's important to deal with methane as well as CO2. Um, I have time to refer you to one source for ideas on how to reduce methane emissions. I would suggest you look up publications from the Methane Guiding Principles Partnership, which is a consortium of companies. Um, and, and just as an example of their publications, I'd refer you to a best practice guide on flaring uh, that was issued by the partnership in November of last year. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I look forward to um, questions and discussion, and I hope you all learn a lot during this competition. Well, thank you very much to our four uh, panelists. Uh, you know, these were, I learned a lot, so um, I hope the audience has as well. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we really kind of, you know, hit our, you know, the, the, the topic over the head, right, of, you know, really, you know, our society um, kind of needs to wean ourselves off of resources like oil and gas, right? But the, the fact of the matter is that currently, um, you know, our other uh, energy resources and infrastructure um, right, does, is not able to kind of capture that. Um, and so, for example, I think, Shayla, you started off by, uh, with, a, with a graph of um, the different energy resources, you know, starting from 1800, right? And it really looks like it takes about kind of 50 years um, to, for us to go from one type of energy resource to another. And so um, this is a question to all of the panelists. Um, you know, as we start to kind of drive ourselves towards net, uh, net zero emissions, um, what are some of the kind of main technical and maybe policy limitations that's, uh, or, or maybe economic limitations that's kind of preventing us from getting there more quickly? So I'll, I'll go with that. Um, yeah, so CCS is uh, uh, eminently feasible. We, we, know, we know how to do it. Uh, we know how to do it correctly. Uh, it is not cheap. Um, it takes a lot of energy, as, as uh, uh, has been mentioned, uh, to uh, capture uh, to, and, and, to, and to do the other things necessary in order to um, sequester it. Um, so it's not cheap and we don't have, generally speaking, in, in, in the world, we don't have uh, the sort of climate policies and regulations that it, that it takes uh, to, to create an economic incentive that's high enough to really spur the, the development of, of CCS and other uh, mitigation strategies that, that we need. Um, uh, another big a lack, I believe, uh, in, in, in making sure that, that CCS can contribute um, is uh, a lack of, of regulatory regimes re relating to the um, uh, operations involved in sequestering um, CO2 in, in geologic formations. Um, there's, there, there are a lot of good frameworks um, and, and some early regulations in, in various places. 
but just as the CCS uh, industry needs to mature, uh, it's also important for the regulatory structures to, to mature as well. I would uh, add, add to that um, um, the following. We need, we've, we've externalized the cost of emitting CO2 for a very long time. We've gotten used to uh, an economy um, and prices of stuff, prices of energy, where that cost has been externalized. So at the same time, however, um, I alluded to this briefly, um, the notion of the business of business no longer simply being business, as the Chicago School, Milton Friedman and others uh, have long preached, uh, the notion of who are the stakeholders is starting to expand and the notion of sustainable finance is becoming crucial. So if we can get the policy and social innovations in place that put the value of as I mentioned earlier, indoor air quality on the table, put the value of future generations per the Bruntman report on the table, and that's included. We need to have the, the, a broader cost structure in mind. Still, bottom line, it's going to cost more than it used to. And so we have an interesting challenge in the context of energy poverty, and I don't know how to solve it, uh, but we need to address how we get clean, reliable, non-carbon emitting and non-methane and the other things that, that uh, we just heard about. Um, how to deliver that in countries where they're down on the bottom left-hand corner of Shayla's slide. So that, that the social innovation is, I would say, when uh, more important than the technological innovation. A lot of things we know how to do, we just need to deploy them. I mean, one way of dealing with the cost for those countries that are in the you know, top right of the diagram would be in the way I described, if you sell fossil fuels or you burn fossil fuels in developed nations, you have to put the same amount of CO2 underground and the cost of doing that is factored into the cost you know, of the services or the fuel you provide. And it's, it's similar in the UK, we've done this with uh, nuclear power stations where the government doesn't put up the money to build the nuclear power station, but they guarantee an electricity price and it's higher than the normal price because it's a carbon free price. So there are, there are mechanisms to do it, but Steve is right at the moment, that's not how it's been done. It's just viewed as a cost and add on to what we're already doing unabated and, and that isn't gonna work. Great. So th that kind of sets up the next uh, question that, that um, I have pretty well. So you guys have all kind of touched on this idea of economics um, and how economics, uh, you know, for example, uh, our current transition away from coal is, is you know, a part driven by um, its emissions related issues, but also a big part due to its economics. Um, natural gas has just become simply cheaper than coal to use then, uh, and, and that's why, um, right, we're phasing out of, uh, uh, you know, these carbon intensive fuels. So what are some of the ways that we can make uh, carbon capture and storage uh, more economic? Are there things that we can, you know, or can we make use of the carbon that we've captured instead of, you know, sequestering it underground or something like that, just to make a product that is, uh, you know, that can help with economic development? I'll jump in on one part of this. When I was talking about direct air capture, things that pull CO2 from the atmosphere, because that was a crazy thing to do, Nobody worked on it for a long time. Now that it's become a key thing we need to do, that's known as an area that's ripe for innovation. So the energy costs for doing it now, it can be done. Carbon engineering is building something. It's net carbon negative. It requires a fair amount of energy to do it. There are more elegant ways to do it and research is happening, but the cost of this technology could go down as dramatically as the cost of photovoltaic power has gone down. So that will help. That will help enormously. Um, conventional capture, um, I'll 
other folks can, can comment on that, but that's one angle that I, I'm intrigued by, Lynn, is that if we make just a direct air capture, a an inexpensive technology, there's huge scope. Okay, I'll, I'll, give, I'll stop talking in a minute. Do you know Martin's uh, stranded resources from that paper uh, uh, from a few years ago? That, that got a lot of attention. What can you do with a stranded resource in the current regime or the past regime? Nothing. But if you, if you use that resource just to drive direct air capture, it's no longer a stranded resource. It's a way to help address the climate problem. You may never sell any of that gas into the market or build a pipeline or an LNG terminal. You could just use it to drive direct air capture and you've got a place to store it. So there's other innovative ways to think about how we can do things if we can bring the cost of that technology down. Yeah, as, as, as Steve just kind of implied, one, one thing uh, good about the economics of direct air capture is that you can locate your capture facility uh, right on top of a good sequestration site, which, which so you don't have to transport it, which can be a significant cost as well as a significant um, challenge just, just, to, just to put um, pipe, pipe in the ground. Um, I, I would also add uh, on, on one aspect of your question um, uh, about carbon utilization. Um, a decade ago, everybody referred to CCS, and then somewhere between a decade ago and now, it became CCUS. Uh, the U stands for utilization. Um, uh, in, Environmental Defense Fund is, is, is thoroughly convinced that, that um, geologic sequestration, the S, is ready for prime time if as long as we have the right regulatory structures and the right financial uh, incentives. Um, as far as the, the U, utilization, um, we're, we're hopeful and we, we recognize that it's got potential, uh, but we don't think it's yet ready for prime time. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done on, on um, defining the protocols that need to be followed in order to quantify the, the benefits long term. Um, I, and I guess I would just add that um, as far as types of utilization that have potential, there's, there's, there's two things that I understand have the, uh, the uh, potential to sequester billions of tons rather than millions of tons. One of those would be utilization of, of CO2 as part of transportation fuels, and the other would be um, incorporating CO2 into Built certain building materials, uh, cement, concrete, and aggregates. I would add one more thing to that, Lynn, um, in terms of, it's a variation on utilization. The province of Alberta, two weeks ago, announced its hydrogen strategy. The federal government of Canada is gonna deliver its version here in, in a few weeks, probably. Um, and the, the, the idea is this, take methane, do conventional steam methane reforming, which is done in every refinery in the world, but do it in order to produce hydrogen to put into the fuel system, okay? So what I keep telling people is, interesting idea, great. The hydrogen, when you use it, is clearly a zero carbon um, fuel, but there is no hydrogen strategy without a concurrent CO2 storage strategy. But the point here is that this may be a way to add, to incentivize uh, the CCS, build out the CCS industry as if it has to happen if we're gonna do this hydrogen thing. Australia is doing this as well, turning for heaven's sake, coal into hydrogen, sending the hydrogen to, to Japan. So people are, are looking at these kinds of things and they'll be storing their CO2 offshore um, Australia. So there are some other things percolating um, which may, for, to, to your question, help uh, uh, move CCS from being something associated with just existing fixed source fossil fuel plants to something that happens as we uh, produce so-called blue hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great. Um, well, thank you guys. Um, so I guess, uh, Martin, you had mentioned that, you, so you showed a graph of, uh, you know, our current kind of CO2 emission trends and then where we need to kind of get to uh, by 2050, right? We it, it effectively, we need to decline very, very rapidly in terms of our CO2 emissions and, and then effectively reach a carbon almost negative um, emission strategy by 2050. So that's obviously a huge volume of CO2 that needs to be first of all captured and then stored somewhere or, you know, put away somehow. So can you talk about um, what are the capacities for storage that we have on earth and, um, and what are the rates for, for um, that we can achieve with this, right? Is it, you know, what, what is kind of for a, one storage site, let's say, how much uh, can we store in a year or something like that? How, so what, what are the scales of this kind of a, a process? Okay, that, thank you for that. Some parts of the world are blessed with large sedimentary basins that are close to point sources. So, so an obvious example is Northern Europe with uh, storage underneath the North Sea. So the one example I gave was uh, a million tons per year. Obviously, to be gigatons, you'd have to have thousands of projects. But it's estimated that the storage capacity underneath the North Sea is of the order of hundreds of gigatons. There are large sedimentary basins in the United States. This would be onshore storage. So there is a little bit more of a concern about regional pressurization right, and induced seismicity. But there are other parts of the world, India and China, where it will be more challenging. And then that brings in the beauty of the air capture because the air capture can be done in those countries that are richer and also have a storage site. In terms of rate of implementation, at the moment it looks pretty bad because we're starting from almost zero and we have to ramp up. But one of my uh, colleagues at Imperial College, Sam Crever, just this year published a paper that did a sort of um, Hubbard style analysis of the buildup of CCS projects and actually showed if you extrapolate the current growth rate in these projects, we can meet the targets for gigaton scale CCS within the coming decades. So it is genuinely a challenge, but it's not an insurmountable one. I would add that um, the um, the, 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 the fact that there is plenty of capacity in sedimentary basins, um, it, it, it's not the end of the story. As, as I said earlier, um, you can't do CCS uh, just anywhere, even within a sedimentary basin. Uh, and as the IPCC has recognized, uh, if you don't carefully select uh, your sites within sedimentary basins, this is just not um, uh, going to work. Great, so then that kind of brings to the, uh, uh, maybe a final question from the, from, um, from me before we uh, move on to student questions or audience questions. Um, so you guys have kind of touched now on the importance of siting. So, you know, siting is, you know, we need to pick a, a, a reservoir for example, that has you know a large capacity, um, we can store things quickly, um, but that it also is relatively sealed off from the rest of the world, so we can store this safely. Um, what about direct air capture? What are some of the um, you know opportun more opportunistic sites that we can implement this? So, for example, I think Steve, you mentioned. Um, that Oxy has plans to capture CO2 from air directly uh, in the Permian Basin. And so I'm wondering what is the scale and rate of direct air capture um, compared to, for example, why don't we just kind of curb flaring or venting, you know, directly at the wellheads, um, right? So, I mean, kind of the, the question is, you know, the, what, what is the importance of concentrations here, right? Because at the emission site, you've got a high concentration point source and then in the air, you've got right, relatively lower uh, concentrations. And so what are the kind of the economics that go into siting and what are some of the more um, strategic sites that we can implement this around the world um, in developed and unde relatively undeveloped countries? Thank you for asking the question that way, Wynn. You said, why do direct air capture when we 
should be addressing the flaring. So I will say again, and I've learned this from <laughs> being on these kinds of panels and giving some, the key word here, everybody listening is and. <laughs> we need to address everything on Shayla's picture with carbon, with methane, with water. We have to do all these things. So, so to, the, to your point about the economics, win. so the CEO of Oxy, was that a year, a year ago, six months, I forget exactly when, um, said basically this, we are going to produce the last barrel of oil sold into the market. You know, we're on this ramp to replace it all. We'll sell the last barrel. Why does she say that? Because her barrel is going to be the lowest carbon barrel. It might even be a zero carbon barrel, right? So, so betting on direct air capture as a way to, as Martin pointed out, the only way you're going to survive as an oil company is for every ton of CO2 your business produces, store a ton of CO2. Okay, one a quick aside, I'll get back to your point in a moment, but we've been talking about oil and gas. Go look and see what Microsoft has said about CO2 emissions, Walmart, um, Amazon, and both Walmart and Amazon have got a lot of skin in this game. You know, they're relying on a whole lot of diesel trucks to, to, to run their businesses, right? So, and then go look at the capitalization of those three companies and the capitalization of the 10 largest independent oil and gas companies. It's an interesting comparison. There is money to do this and there is corporate will to do this. Okay, so I wanted to make that point. To the point about gas. Now, so Oxy is looking at, <laughs> instead of having to go into contract with Kinder Morgan to buy their CO2, they could just pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if carbon engineering drives down the price, they have a new business model, okay. But gas is, is a key bridge fuel for a lot of reasons. And the place we get a whole lot of gas these days is uh, unconventionals, tight formations. And so up here in, in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, there's the Montagny play, there's the Duvernay, enormous gas reserves. It turns out an interesting way you could do this when, is to, most of the gas you're producing today is from wells you drilled in the last two years. Wells you drilled 10 years ago are still producing, but it's 5% of what you're putting into the pipeline. The nice thing about a lot of the Marcellus is this way, uh, the biggest gas field in the world in Iran is this way. The density of CO2 is such that if you just replace the gas that you produce, just put CO2 into that pore space, you will offset the methane and then some, the, the CO2 from burning the methane. So one way to, to do this is to, you can do the math, gas prices are going up here in North America, but at uh, $2 a gigajoule for selling gas, you could, if, you have, if you're getting $50 a ton to store CO2, those revenue streams are the same magnitude to completely offset that CO2. So, so there's different ways to look at the economics, but as Scott was pointing out to Martin as well, without a policy um, and a market where you can actually monetize these kinds of things, can I sell into the low carbon fuel standard market of California, for example, if I'm doing this negative emissions thing? Um, so as soon as we get some of those in place, there's a lot of interesting possibilities. So we haven't really addressed this seriously. It's been looked as an add-on, we'll get around to it. But I think now that the, the tides are shifting, that's why I show that the world changed 2018, 2019. Um, we can bring, bring a new mindset to this, I think. If, if Oxy succeeds in, in tapping into the California low carbon fuel standard uh, credit and, and then with that money builds the first full, full scale uh, direct air capture facility out in, in the Permian, um, uh, my understanding is that they plan to do another nine of those. So, so, they, so in fairly short order, I don't know how many years, but not all that many years, they would be ramping up from a 1 million uh, tons a year level to a 10 million ton uh, a year level. Uh, part, part of your question uh, ha ha had to do with optimum siting for uh, 
uh, direct air capture. A um, couple of things pop into my mind. One is um, um, I, I think offshore has a lot of uh, um, attractions, as, as Martin, Mar Martin mentioned one of them at least, um, um, the, the um, induced seismicity uh, it, it issue is not as troublesome. Um, but um, it's also easier, at, le at least in the United States, where, where, where poor space is usually owned by many, many people, uh, it, it's going to be pretty hard to assemble the property rights necessary to do sequestration, uh, except in oil fields in the onshore United States, but, but offshore, uh, the government owns the poor space. And uh, so you only have to deal with one, one entity. So, so um, siting DA facility, DAC facilities uh, along the shore of uh, where, where there are good um, nearby uh, sequestration prospects, I think would be good. And then the other thing that popped in my mind is the, uh, distinction between sequestering in hydrocarbon reservoirs and sequestering in saline uh, formations. Uh, there, there's one way in which um, the, the uh, using hydrocarbon reservoirs is, is uh, not nearly as good as uh, saline, and that is that um, uh, by definition, uh, uh, developed hydrocarbon reservoirs have, have had lots and lots of wellbore penetrations, and each one of those wellbore penetrations is a potential uh, leakage risk. Uh, your saline formations, though, since they don't really have oil and gas, uh, have been largely spared all those um, uh, penetrations, and so if you have a good seal, it's less likely to have been um, compromised. Um, but all the other all the other factors that I can think of favor sequestering in in the oil fields. Basically, they're informational in nature. Uh, the oil fields are very very well understood, and the saline formations, by and large, are not nearly as well understood. So I'm I'm going to jump in with a question from the audience. So, um, and and what I want to do since we have about ten minutes left. Um, I want to just have you give me a, a direct, uh, unequivocated answer. So the question is, what is the time frame to net zero um, emissions? And let's say for the oil and gas sector, not, not everything. So if you can just give me a date, is it 2020, 2040, 2060? What's your best estimate since we have you experts here? So Steve Bryant, what is your, what is your number? I haven't ever worked out that number. Uh, it'll take a couple of decades. Would you want okay. a short answer? I'll tell you, I can tell you why if people can. Okay, These okay. Years. Okay, so people are, I mean, many, for instance, many companies, Martin showed, BP has said 2050. So is that a reasonable number? So um, Scott, what do you think is a good number for the oil and gas business to go net zero? Yeah, I, I think I think 2050 is the right number to use as a goal. Um, I personally think that um, the goal probably won't be met um, and that um, I, I, I think it can be met, but it's gonna be, I think, I think it'll be a struggle to, to meet it by 2050. And this underscores the importance of negative mm -hmm. technologies because if we overshoot uh, net zero by 2050, as I'm afraid we probably will, uh, we're gonna have to make up for lost time through negative emissions. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's 2050. Um, and I actually think independent oil companies need to do that. Otherwise, they might lose their license to operate. Okay. So then I'm going to direct a, a question just to be able to get through these just, just to Martin here. Um, so um, as far as CO2 containment, this is something um, I've seen with projects like this, talking to the, the people that live on top of the ground um, beneath which sequestration is going on. This, this would be for onshore projects. Um, some people are afraid of CO2, that you know it's a, a dangerous gas, and if it leaks out, there's gonna be problems. Can you comment on that aspect of, you know, should we be afraid of, afraid of CO2? Well, I think the short answer is no. Um, you know, CO2 is not an explosive gas. Um, people live with methane uh, beneath their feet. Um, there's even actually, methane beneath where, where I am, but very deep. 
So we also have a good understanding of the physical processes that occur when CO2 is injected. And it's not like nuclear waste storage. It actually gets safer and safer over time. Obviously, we have to be very careful, as Scott pointed out, exactly where we inject. And often those problems are to do with induced seismicity, actually not about necessarily leakage. But it is something that we need to, you know, the, the people need to be involved. They need to see CCS as a vital component of moving towards a, a carbon neutral economy. And I think if people were to buy into that, they, they, this would lessen the concern. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm gonna direct this question to Steve. Um, so I teach a freshman class um, in petroleum engineering and one of our first uh, tasks in laboratories to do exercises on the technology for injecting CO2 in the ground. And so we're introducing that concept to petroleum engineers. Um, Martin was talking about the ramp up required in, in this Hubbard analysis type curve that maybe that would represent ramp up um, a big part of that is workforce. Can you comment on where is the workforce going to come from for this tremendous effort that we're going to make um, to store CO2 under the ground? Well, the Hildebrand Department is one such place. <laughs> <laughs> Free plug. Uh, that was not a planned response. But this is what a number of us have been saying for some time now. I've been advocating that we rebrand our oil and gas program up here as it's, it's, it's about carbon. It's carbon. Unfortunately, the company has already taken the name, but we're really talking about carbon engineering now, where you're producing it or storing it. It's the same kinds of technology. It's the same fluid flows, the same physics. You get some more chemistry in there when it's CO2. But, but as you know, and Martin pointed this out, the skill set is directly mappable from traditional oil and gas production is directly mappable into CO2 with some additional uh, you know, topside stuff, production facilities, gas handling facilities, pipelines, et cetera. So, so it'll be, it needs to be huge. And this is part of the, the, the interesting challenge is do you, do you have the workforce in place in time to build it out? Uh, we, don't, we sure don't want to get stuck waiting for, for people who can get the jobs built and, and running. Okay, so let me let me give the, the last question to uh, Scott here, and um, this is also somewhat of a workforce question, but um, I think I think you alluded to and maybe directly said that that regulatory frameworks and regulators are going to be required to manage this business, um, and um, we here in the United States see all kinds of discussion in, on the political realm and also the technical realm, realm about regulations and are they good or bad or whatever. Um, think about the international stage. Is the regulatory expertise and um, framework out there in countries? And, and how, do you, how do you see that? And you might refer to the United States if you, if you want to, but, but what about the regulatory side of this? How do governments play a role? Yeah, so there, there are some interesting frameworks uh, besides in the United States. Uh, 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 Australia has a, has, a, has, a, has a pretty good system. Uh, I think, I think can, uh, Canadian regulators uh, have, have a good handle on this. Um, uh, um, there, there is, um, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be followed up with a bunch of projects, but, but, but there is law and regulation in, in um, the, the European Union. But I, I would stress that this workforce development uh, need uh, applies um, equally in the regulatory realm as it does uh, among companies. And um, an um, effort that we're engaged in right now is to uh, uh, develop a sophisticated curriculum for regulators. Um, um, you know, what, what are the things they need to know something about, uh, but more importantly, uh, how, how much depth do they need to know? Do they a, a little bit or really, really deep? Uh, do they need to become numerical modelers? Probably not, but do they need to be able to tell the difference between somebody who, who knows what they're doing <laughs> modeling wise and someone who doesn't? Yes, they do need to know that depth. So, so it, it'll take a while, but I think both in the U.S. and elsewhere, it's going to be really important both to develop a good curriculum and then to deliver that, that curriculum. Great, great. Thank you very much. And um, 
and we're at our our time time here so i just want to thank um um all the panelists and uh and the switch alliance um um uh, for the participation and I, I think this went went really great I really really appreciate all the contributions and I'm going to hand it over to Tala to wrap us up for um, the end of the event and uh, it, we all wish you great luck on the upcoming case competition so go go get them and sign up for energy engineering when you're done and come out of school that's this is the place to be this is an exciting field Tala thank you so much uh Thank, thank you panelists for sharing your thoughts about the sustainability in the oil and gas industry and its importance for the environment. So ladies and gentlemen, before we conclude our event, here are a few important guidelines for the team to note. A recorded version of this event will be made available to you at the Switch Energy Alliance website, Facebook page, YouTube channel, and Facebook group. And also please be reminded that next Friday, October 30th, is the final date for the submission of case competition presentations. And there will also be a live tutorial on how to create the video presentation tomorrow, October 25th at 11 a.m. Central Time on Switch Energy Alliance Facebook page. And next Saturday, October 31st, we will also be having our Facebook Live closing event. So we have come to an end of our second Facebook live event. I would like to thank you all for your time and students, good luck with your presentations and we hope to see you next time. Goodbye.